you have your Bible this morning, you can find Exodus chapter 27 and verse 16. As we're going to focus today on the entrance to God. In your outline that I gave you, you do notice that I talked about pluralism. So many religions in the United States today. And automatically, any religion that comes on the scene is automatically elevated equal to or greater than Christianity. We also live in a day of universalism. Universalism simply says that any way can get you to God. Any way will get you to heaven. It's okay to approach God in any way that you want to as long as you approach a God. And for the next, at least through, uh, through January, we're going to look at God's way, God's prescribed way to approach it. And that is only through Jesus Christ. And what I want to use today is the gate of the tabernacle. If you notice down, don't show it. Okay, if you notice at the lower right hand corner, you'll see the gate that went in to the tabernacle. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. Just in a little overview, really quick, we did a study on the tabernacle uh, several years ago, and we did an in-depth study. We did all the typology, uh, all of, the, all of the, the, the materials, the stuff that was used, but we're simply going to focus on this major gate right at the front. Notice, if you look all around it, it's white linen. It was 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, 7.5 feet high. The tents around it, this, this kind of shows it as red, brownish, but according to, to historians, it would have been black. So you've got a black sea of tents around this white tabernacle. Seven and a half feet high, most people couldn't, uh, couldn't see over it. Couldn't go over it, couldn't go over it, couldn't go through it. So that is a barrier that is separating the sinful nation of Israel from a holy and a just God. If you look at the top of the picture, there is no gate there. There is only one gate at the very front of it. Notice in contrast also that it's solid white all the way around, except when you get to the entrance, the, which end was the entrance on? So y'all who the study, which end was it on? It was on the eastern end. So where is Jesus supposed to come back to? The eastern sky. So already God is prefiguring the way that we are going to have to approach God. The gate was a was not locked. It was not you were not kept out by ritual or by standard or by social uh, economic standing or by your educational level. It was a gate, a curtain. A child can push back a curtain. An older person can open a curtain. So it's an accessible gate. It's not locked. It's not barring you from going there. But it's telling you that God has said there is one way to Him. And that's through this gate. Universalism is a lie out of the pit of hell. Pluralism goes along with humanism that is willing to accept anything that comes down the pipe. Friends, Christianity is the only, listen to me, the only true religion. Amen. I know that may offend you, may make some people mad, may have some of your kid people mad. And when I say Christianity, I'm talking about plain, simple belief in Jesus Christ as your Savior. I'm not talking about denominationalism. Or sectarianism, I'm simply talking about there's one way, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to see that as we go through there. If you do a study on the tabernacle, uh, you'll remember that everything in this tabernacle is, a, is typical of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's only one entrance. Jesus said in John 14 and 6, why? I am the way, not many ways. But the way. And we have to keep that in mind in, in the world in which we live today. Uh, I've, I've been reading articles online lately about this stuff. There is so much going on in the world 
and other religions are getting so much priority now in our nation. I mean, our nation just elected two Muslim women to serve in Congress. You think they swore in on the Bible? No. I know I'm getting full of quarrel. No, that's true. It's true. And you know they're going to introduce a bill in Congress this week to ban, to, to lift the ban on having to wear head, uh, women, uh, uh, head covers in Congress so these two women can be part of it. We're allowing that to come in, but we're shutting out Christ. You can't pray in school. You can't, you can't say, uh, you know, Merry Christmas or stuff like this. But if another religion comes in, automatically they're really lenient to let them come in and be part of us. There's only one law in this nation. That's God's law. So, having said all that and made that pretty mad, God has given us one way, and that's Jesus Christ. How do we approach God? Do we approach Him the way God said to approach Him, or do we do it on our own? You know, it's okay, everybody enjoy it. I don't have to do that. I don't have to attend church. I don't have to use my gifts and my talents to serve God. I can just come and just do any way I want to, live any way I want to, come on Sunday morning. I'm blessed and highly favored because I'm in church. Is that how you approach God? Do you, do you approach God as the absolute sovereign creator of the universe? Amen. That we should humble ourselves before and get on our knees before in prayer and <coughs> seek His favor? <coughs> how do we approach God? So, if you found your place, Exodus chapter 47, verse 16, would you please stand with me while we honor the reading of God's word? It simply says, For the gate of the court there shall be a screen twenty cubits long, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, made by a weaver. It shall have four pillars and four stockings. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word that you preserved for all the centuries that we might have the truth. And Lord, your truth stands above and is the only truth that we as Christians should adhere to. Uh, Lord, I just thank you uh, for the privilege to uh, proclaim your word and expound upon it. And Father, I just pray that you would bless it as it goes out today. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. Thank you for Four points I want to make about this gate. First of all, it is a single gate, not many gates. The word gate simply means an entrance, and the way it's basically used, it indicates the main entrance to a city where people gather. This was a gate where if the, the sinner would have to bring a sacrifice to the gate. That sacrifice was then taken to the uh, burnt altar to, to offer that sacrifice, and then before they could move any farther into the courtyard. So there had to be an entrance, and that entrance is a totally different entrance. And only, again, there's only one entrance. Look around that whole picture I just showed you. There's only one way in. God was saying right off the bat, I just delivered you out of Egypt, out of bondage. I just paid a price for you, the firstborn of Egypt. And now I'm going to set you a standard and a rule, and you're going to approach me the way I want you to approach me. I am God. I am holy. I am just. And therefore, when you come to me, you must come to me in that fashion. It refers here to the entrance, the only entrance of the courtyard. The court there, it says, uh, it says in that verse, and then the gate of the court, the court simply means a courtyard. It indicates an enclosed area. Again, what is, the, what is that barrier there? 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, 7 and a half feet high. Why is it there? It's to separate, it is, a, it is a demarcation line that separates evil from righteousness and holiness. We are a sinful people. We have a sin nature. We cannot approach God on our own. So something had to be done. It's a single gate. It's a spacious gate. Look at it. It says in there, in there that there was a screen, a curtain, a designation screen, or a hanging due to the tabernacle at the gate for the entrance of the court. And notice that language. 
20 cubits uh, by, uh, you know, 30 feet high by seven and a half feet wide. There's plenty of room for everybody to get in. Isn't that Christianity? Don't we believe in the whosoever will may come? You can come. You can come. You can open that gate, but you have to come. Doesn't the Bible say in Revelation that Jesus stands at the door and knocks? But we have to let him in. The same thing is true here. We have to come to this gate, to the only way that God said I could enter into his presence. That reminds us that God is a holy God, that we are sinners, we need a way, and God has provided that way by making 150 foot by 75 foot, and then in 30 feet, right at the front of it, he gave you all of one end almost to go into it. See, everybody's welcome. A church should never be a place that turns people away because of their clothes or their uh, or their tattoos or hair or whatever it may be. We should, you should never turn somebody away from that. We should always be an open, welcoming, <coughs> loving church. Uh, and you know, I mean, Paul talks about to the Thessalonians, he said, you once were, and then he goes and names all these different things that, 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 that's against God and, and, and sin, and he said, all we all once were these. So we once were just like the world. We were separated from God. But now that we have a way into God, and when we, uh, make, uh, when we go through that gate, then we have access to God. Anybody can come. Thirdly, it is a striking gate. If you notice in that picture where I showed you a while ago, it was solid white all the way around, right? Purity. The purity and holiness of God. But when you got to the gate, don't you know that had to be a striking contrast? You had black tents all the way around it on all four sides. Right in the middle was this jewel of God's glory surrounded by pure white. But right in the entrance, when you got to the entrance, there was a beautiful curtain that was woven with three different colors. A blue, the color of heaven, speaks of the Son of God, satisfying to be the man's of God, and the Son's origin is out of heaven. Blue, uh, the, uh, the purple, uh, is, is a sign of royalty, the color of the king, and refers to the king's mother, redeemer, who is going to bring us to God. That's what Jesus is, is the king's <coughs> redeemer that we see uh, in, in the book of Ruth, Boaz. Who he brought those people together. And, and God, uh, Jesus, can bring us to God once we have gone through that gate. So it's blue. It was purple. It was scarlet. The color of blood. And speaks of sacrifice. The first thing you did when you went through that gate is you had to offer a blood sacrifice. For your sin. We're talking about sin this morning. Not the grain offering and all that other stuff. We're talking about sin. So you had to offer a blood offering. And that speaks of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We're getting ready to celebrate Easter. Are we not? That's the next big calendar for the church, for the for Baptist church, is Easter. And so we're getting, we need to start now and remember that in the very beginning, God said, when you approach me, it's going to have to be through a blood sacrifice. The blood of Jesus saves me. You know, it is, the blood of Jesus covers me. That is the only thing that makes me acceptable to God. Everybody should say amen. amen. We are not acceptable to God in our sinful condition. But God said, I love you enough that I'm going to give my son for you so when he sheds that blood, that I can take that blood spread on the altar of sacrifice so you can have the right to approach me the way I tell you. So if God paid the way for me to go, then I should have enough respect for God to approach him in the way that he said approach him. We have become too lazy and too, uh, too worldly in our church. We have more sin in the church than we have saints. I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about every church. Okay, let me clarify that. And we were supposed to stay holy, a holy people, to honor God. <coughs> That's why you can't allow sin in the church. Because that blood has been shed. And when that blood has been shed, that did it once for all. Read Hebrew. It was a once for all sacrifice. 
Even the high priest had to sacrifice for himself every day and every year when he went in. He had to make sure he was standing before he ever went in any thought. <clears throat> Look at the cloth that it was used. Fine. Denotes the thoughtlessness of the material. Does the, the New Testament not say that Jesus was sinless? He became sin for us who knew no sin. See, there's another one of those little peripheral doctrines that we're letting get shipped away. I think it's 60% of Protestants now says it don't matter whether Jesus was uh, sinless or not. How stupid can you be? And I'm talking mighty, mighty bold this morning, or but you've got to have a sinless sacrifice, right? That's what, that's what the tabernacle was all about. The cloth was a, uh, it was Egyptian. They have, uh, in archaeological discoveries, they have dug up cloth that was like this. Uh, the color white is the color of perfection, purity, and righteousness. Jesus was the righteousness of God. And we become the righteousness of God when we are washed in the blood of our sacrifice uh, who, who, who makes us worthy and acceptable to God. And it was linen. Linen refers to linen from Egypt. It had 152 threads in the rack. Today, the most, the nicest you can get by probably has about 86, according to what I read. So that's twice, almost twice, the, the, the fineness and the, and the thickness of that rack. So what does that tell us? That tells us that Jesus was absolutely faultless, that he was pure, he was righteous, and he was the finest thing to heaven had. Amen. He didn't send us a whole series of road book catalogs that said, here, pick out what you want. He said, I'm sending you the very best that I've got in heaven. And that very best is going to be what gets you through the gate. Look at the construction. It says in that verse, uh, fine woven linen made by a weaver. Uh, the word weaver there uh, uh, means to embroider. Some of you ladies, probably older ladies, uh, learn how to embroider when you're real. Beautiful stuff. I mean, you can make some beautiful stuff embroidered. It takes a lot of time to a lot of teachers work it. You have to take that needle and go in and go under and go down and circle back through and get it and get that area again. It's a lot of work. See, God put a lot of work in our salvation. And we take it so light. We go, oh, I'm saved and I'm good. No, you're not. Because if you live like the rest of the world, you don't know if you're saved or not. You're just fooling with yourself. See, there's a, there's, a, there's a demand that comes with being saved. A weaver to, to embroider, to weave, to do needlework. See, God took a lot of time in His plan of redemption. You see, He's taken eternity so far up to our time to perfect us and to perfect our redemption. And when the time was right, He sent Jesus into this world to deliver us from the sin that we are in. Because God. The Bible says, Luther says in the Old Testament, that man does not have a sacrifice that pleases to God. You can praise him, you can worship him, you can, uh, you can run up and down the hall and jump over the pews, and that don't mean a thing to God. Please. It is the condition of your heart and how you view him and how, and how you view what he did for you. Amen. Last thing I want you to see, it's a supportive case. Four pillars. Shelter wood or Ikea wood. Dark, hard wood. In other words, it was resistant to insects and it lasted a long time. My salvation is eternal. Amen. I don't have to get saved every other week. I don't have to come and beg somebody to pray for me or something like that. When I got saved, God, got, God gave me everything that he had. Amen. Now I've got to learn to submit so God can get everything that I have. Four stocks. Brass signifies divine righteousness and judgment. Silver is the price of life. Remember what they gave Judas for Jesus? Pieces of silver. And you see this all through the Old Testament. I mean, all, yeah, through the Old Testament and through the tabernacle. As you study, this never changes. It's all the same. So, what does that tell us? A lot of people believe that this represents the Word of God. Right? We have four Gospels. Why four Gospels? 
because they present Jesus in four different aspects. You have Matthew, the color of purple, which speaks about the king of the Jews. We talked the other week about tracing his line all the way back to Adam or back to David. And then we have, uh, see, Jesus is the king. Amen. King Jesus. Amen. First time I heard that in a, uh, uh, in, in a, uh, in, in an Afro-American church, and I thought, King Jesus. But it, but they were right. It's King Jesus. He is king, king of kings and lord of lords. And they said, oh, you shouldn't be saying that all the time. That's what we're out saying. Well, it's a fresh sound to say to me. Amen. Matthew's the purple. He's the king. In Mark, scarlet, the suffering servant. In Mark, every time you see Jesus, he's immediately going somewhere and doing something. And he's a servant. He's always serving. When you get to Luke, Luke would be white because Luke pre presents to us the perfect man. Because it had to be a perfect sacrifice okay. in order for God to accept it. John would be the color blue because John simply tells us that Jesus was the Son of God. He doesn't give a genealogy, doesn't give a birth narrative. The, the closest thing he gets to a birth narrative is in John 1 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay. We beheld his word and the glory of the Father. <coughs> and uh, John, John had already made up his mind. John was at the transfiguration. John was at the crucifixion. John was at the resurrection. He knew. He made up his mind. He was settled. He didn't need to read somebody else's new book that came out last week. Well, he didn't read the best-selling best uh, novel going on. He knew who Jesus was, and Jesus was God in the flesh, the unique Son of God. Now, what does all that tell us? Well, we're going to be out early today. I know y'all going to be some happy bad. <laughs> our takeaway we are separated from the way because of our sin nature there's no doubt about that you can't deny that if you go to 1 John John actually says you're lying if you say you've never sinned we've all sinned we all fall short of the glory of God we're separated from that way but thank God he supplied the way and it's his way and we must come in His way. We can't come to God in a frivolous manner and expect God to bless us. We can't live every we, we can't live six days out of the week like the rest of the world, participate in the world, and come to church on Sunday and be the greatest saint in the church. It does not work. You may can fool your neighbor, but you cannot fool God. God knows your heart. And I don't mean this to be a condemning sermon, but I hope the clerics come out that way. We're separated because of our sin nature. God has supplied a way. We should love God as much as God loves us because God didn't have to save us, but He did. Thirdly, the strictness of the way is simply Jesus. You go read it. You look at the Greek text, it says the way. Not a way, not some way, not various ways. <coughs> but one simple way, the way. And if God is so strict with His order of salvation and His free grace, then we need to recognize that and we need to go with that and does it help. I'm concerned about our nation. I'm sure you've got that this morning. Really? I'm really concerned about where we're headed. We're letting everything come in and we're stopping Christianity. Did you know in India, they've got a new uh, prime or premier or whatever it is now, and they have really started persecuting the Christians in India. <clears throat> Openly, I'm talking about. That's coming here, though. If we don't, as Mama used to say, if you don't put your foot down, <laughs> it's going to happen. We're getting more and more different religious ideas in our government and who you think changes that. Think about that. They've learned the system. They've learned how it works. Nikita Khrushchev said years ago that they would take us over from the inside because we're going to fall apart. We will have nothing to believe in. We will have no rock-solid truth that we claim and we all agree on. We're going to shatter like a piece of glass. 
if we don't turn back to God. And God said there's one way to do that. Lastly, the simplicity of the way, as I said to start with in my, in my intro, a little child can open the veil and put it back. An aged person struggling with a cane or even move can part that curtain and go through. See, God made it so simple. He said, all you have to do is believe in the name of the Son of God and you will have eternal life. Are you approaching God the way that He's prescribed to? Are you serious about your Christianity? Let me take that out of it. Are you serious about your relationship with God? Because that's what counts. It's not where you go to a bad church, bad church, whatever kind of church it is. That doesn't count a thing. It's your relationship with Almighty God through Jesus Christ. And if that's not right, I'll be like Charles Stanley. If you're listening, say amen. amen. If that's not right in your life, nothing else will be. You can forget it. <coughs> nothing else is going to be right. Your marriage, your job, personal relationship. Because God is the absolute sinner. Center, I mean, when I say center, center of everything that we do as Christians. Everything. So how do you approach God? Father God, thank you uh, for the word that you've given us this morning. Lord, I'm sorry it came out a little abrasive and a little bold and hard, I guess. But but Lord, we need to get serious about our relationship and our fellowship. And Father, I pray that you've spoken to our hearts this morning. And that in speaking to our hearts, that we will uh, recognize and respond in like manner. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.